associate professors in the Department of Architecture here at FIU, and also part of the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. And Take two, yes. but not so interesting part is what you missed, so I'll go on. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Tony Griffin uh, today to speak for the third. All the way down. It's right. off, it's off. And but I, that's the way it was just now when they protested. So is it, it's not working? I mean. Which is the one that's not working? This one or the feet? Is this better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I figured it out on my own. Okay. Uh, I will start again. Uh, we are Lisa Sylvan Gray Reed, Associate Professor of the Department of Architecture here at FIU and also the Wilsonian Public Humanities Lab. We're delighted to welcome Tony Griffin today to speak for the third plenary of the ARCC meetings. A social interest and focus in architecture school, and I believe that is the case here at FIU, has been provoked to a certain degree by students. They have asserted themselves and asked the school leadership to bring curricula and studios closer to field experiences and prepare them to defend a more just built environment. This has happened since the tragedy of George Floyd and Lives Matter movement some years before that. But I would like to celebrate and acknowledge that Tony Griffin has been actively seeking paths for the discourse of social justice within the discipline of architecture and city making for more than a decade. When she started the, uh, her office, Urban AC, which is Urban American City based in New York, and more recently, the Just City Lab at Harvard GSD. She's trained as an architect and worked professionally for SOM in Chicago for a number of years until becoming associate partner. All the while, she sought opportunities to become socially engaged with the city's social issues through art institutions and professional architecture associations, and then made a leap into what she calls planning, but I would call something more like advocacy and activism, channeling her energy and concerns back into the public sector as director of community development for Newark, vice president and director of design for the Anacostia Waterfront Corporation in Washington, DC, and deputy director for revitalization and neighborhood planning for the DC Office of Planning. She has also contributed significantly to advance that discourse in educational institutions as professor of architecture and the founding director of the Max Bond Center of Design for the Just City at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College in New York, and now through the Just City Lab at Harvard GSD. I am grateful and in awe of her accomplishments, having produced an important body of publications and artifacts, I use her word. She underscores how important it is to make her experiences and the knowledge she has been building in collaboration with many other professionals and with her students accessible to as wide an audience as possible. To that effect, designforthejustcity.org is a website her team has put together and I encourage everybody to visit it. They have generously made available all her lectures, all of their publications and design initiatives. The content, the content looks deeply at the city. It's knowledge gener it is knowledge generated on the field as an indispensable condition to identify what is really happening. Inequality and injustice are not just about disinvestment, not just about the emptying out of our cities. So much needs to be unpacked in terms of what is not fair what are the messages our cities are giving its inhabitants and future inhabitants, understanding cities as educators of citizens? Tacitly, but with great deal of strength, those messages are actually promoting exclusion. And here I think it is important to note that exclusion has been conflated with forms of capital investment. And we need to question and tell ourselves that it is no longer okay to remain silent and permissive about these forces simply because they are driven by the, quote, invisible and inevitable justification of the market. And it's difficult conversation, it's uncomfortable. She says this repeatedly and clearly. 
but we cannot ignore the inequalities that our cities are not only allowing to occur, but very strongly exacerbating through design. Observation and field work with our students in Pittsburgh yielded what they call patterns of injustice, which are then countered with design approaches that embody values and begin to articulate a vocabulary of what is just through design in the city. She also often has her students write a manifesto for social justice in cities, which gets at a primary question. What do we individually and collectively understand as justice? It's more than Henry Lefebvre's or David Harvey's or Brazil's federal law recognizing, quote, the right to the city. It is about fairness, dignity, recognition, acknowledgement. These might be understood as passive actions, but also preemptive ones such as remediation and repair to celebrate our ability to generously, amorously right past wrongs. I'm intrigued by analyses and approaches she has, adv she, advanced, she has advanced not only in cities of the United States, such as St. Louis, where I am partly from, Chicago, where she is from, Detroit and DC, but also internationally in the Netherlands, Nigeria and South Africa. And there are a myriad of ways her work connects with some of the work our colleagues are presenting in these few days that we are together at FIU. Across the conversations we're having in this conference's workshops, the factors of injustice embedded in cities through unquestioned notions of growth, extraction, and exclusion, which were elaborated this morning by Jeremy Till, are well cemented in the makeup of cities of the global north. And that was touched on this morning by Nicole Howell and Milad Mosari's studies of Chicago and Salt Lake City. In contrast, we find that the Global South offers more diffuse manifestations of habitat expressed through self-built neighborhoods, which although indicative of stark inequalities, have a lot to teach us as we learn to listen better. And I highlight here the work of Tanare Meshkani, looking at Medellin and Beirut, and the work of Scott Shaw, who has been engaging and empowering communities in barrios of uh, La Paz, Bolivia, and Port Elizabeth in South Africa. In a workshop this morning, we began to touch on pedagogy and social justice, which we'll have a workshop on that Saturday with interventions by Philip uh, Grauen, Erica Zekos, and a group from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical and University. I also hope we will further discuss the weight of observing, mapping, listening, and acknowledging other forms of design and other forms of spatial practice through uh, tomorrow morning's workshop with Peter Wong, Gray Reed, and Elizabeth Cronin. I'd like to end my part of this introduction and then hand it over to my colleague, Gray Reed, by recalling the message of Colombian anthropologist Arturo Escobar, his publication, Design for the Pluriverse, which expresses and explores methodologies and theories of collective, collective existence and creation. What he calls autonomous design to challenge modernist anthropo anthropocentrism, through explorations of alternative spatial practices, he adv advocates for the redesign of human beings as ones that can conceive, acknowledge, and embrace a plural universe, the pluriverse, which is a world that fits many worlds, poses an opportunity to project what and especially how our field can contribute to equity, universal access, and a much better relationship with nature. It points to a more hybrid, nuanced, and complex conception of design. And so I'll hand it over now to Ray. Okay, thanks very much. And I'm really delighted that Tony is here. It's, just, it's, a, it's a real treat to, um, to hear from her and her work. And I think, you know, we're running a little late on time and we had anticipated having some kind of conversation, but I think maybe it, I'd just like to send a couple of questions out there <laughs> for you to think about and uh, hopefully bring up at the reception. And the two questions are, um, in terms of the way that we are, are engaging this climate breakdown, and I use Jeremy Till's language here, what would justice look like in your community? And just think about the work that you do and what you see, and what would, what would it look like if the city truly were just. The second question is thinking about Jeremy Till's idea that the future is already here, that it's, it's there in things that many of us are, are doing, 
that where do you see these positive futures? Where do you see them in your community? So just, I don't know, let that cook for a little while. And, and uh, you know, we can, we can talk about these things at the, at the reception. So the reception, after this talk, I would like to invite you over to the library, which is kind of that way. We'll, I think we'll go more or less together for an exhibition called Climates of Inequality. And uh, this is uh, an exhibition put together by the Humanities Action Lab, which is based in Rutgers, New Jersey. It's a collaboration of 22 universities, including FIU, <laughs> which um, each of which identified a social justice issue in their community, took students out there to talk to the people on the front lines, particularly people who are resisting and who are, um, and who are actively pushing for, um, for change. And those students then, um, you know, talked to people, understood the issue, and developed a presentation that you will see over in the library in, in each one of their various communities. Um, they did oral histories and research, and that's what you're going to see. So this, the Climates of Inequality exhibition is supported by the Mellon Foundation, um, both through the Humanities Action Lab and through our own FIU Wolfsonian Public Humanities Lab that Elisa and I are both, um, are both part of. So I'll briefly mention two projects that FIU is doing that I see as little points of possible futures out there as a way to kind of um, just sort of get things going. Um, the first is this, is the uh, larger project of the Wolfsonian Hum Public Humanities Lab called Commons for Justice, which started with the intention of working with low-income communities to identify things that would help them become more, more resilient. There's that word, resilient, which it has its own you know, issues that we heard about this morning. Um, and what they had in mind was in the face of climate upset, hurricanes, uh, flooding, sea level rise, heat stress, and so forth. But, and Jim Murley, who we heard in the plenary first, talked about all those things, just, you know, sea level rise, heat stress, thing, 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 like that. That's what, they, that's what they went out to find out. They talked to the communities and the community said, ah, you know, what we're really worried about is, is that the rent is going up. We are really worried about climate gentrification, about not climate gentrification, but we're really, really worried about gentrification. That's the thing that's keeping us up at night. And that wasn't the answer that we were looking for, but it highlights the sort of global interconnectedness of everything. The, the, the flight capital that's coming into Miami from Russia, from Latin America, every time there's an upset in the world, we get a flood of, uh, a flood of people and real estate prices, you know, up through the roof at this point. So, um, you know, it's just that this, this, these climate issues are not so simple. And it's, you know, ultimately it's not about the hurricane. It's about, um, it's about sort of global capital and all these, all these interconnected issues. So that's one project learning to listen and teaching students to learn to listen to the people in their communities and really hear what are the issues. The other project is speaking for non-humans. And this is the FIU Long-Term Everglades Research Project. And this is scientists out there listening to the ecosystem through their instrumentation, trying to understand what it needs. They learn the language of water quality, of vegetation, of nutrient flows, to hear what the ecosystem has to say. So two themes coming out of this, <clears throat> learning to listen and being with your, with your community, both the human and the non-human parts of it. So I think um, at this point, if we could ask Tony um, to... <clears throat> Thank you.
doing so, you know, as an architect, um, I still like to call myself that. Um, I'm still one of only about 500 African American women in the United States to ever be licensed. There's an architect now. There's 120,000. So I still have my stamp and my number. And I'm keeping it, even though I'm not practicing at the moment. But I've morphed into an urban designer and a planner. And I come to this notion of justice through that journey. Um, and I wish I had as much foresight, I think, as you gave me a little bit of credit for, but I actually didn't. Um, and you know, you reflect on your work over time and maybe you find where there were those moments where, yeah, it was always there. But in the moment, you know, you're not as crystal clear and you certainly don't have, and I didn't have any of this vocabulary when I was in architecture school. So the fact that, you know, your instructors are bringing this um, into this type of space of this conference and hopefully into your classrooms is uh, far ahead of anything I ever experienced. Um, in my academic career. So um, let's take you on this journey, perhaps, maybe. You're not gonna have to do that for me, are you? Oh. Okay, you figured that out. Okay, so before we get to justice, um, I think I came up down, okay. Um, you screwed it up, Charlotte, not me. <laughs> um, before I get to this notion of justice, and thank you for those prompts, Greg, because hopefully when I was like, hey, it's going to kind of lean into those questions. I think I first thought about injustice um, as a concept of space and place, right? Um, why did I start to think about injustice first? Because I found that um, I was working in environments, particularly as I'm more for being an architect than a planner in different cities where I was confronting the same type of challenges. So for me now, injustice is, are these actions and conditions that disadvantage those already excluded from entitlements as a result of unfair discriminatory practices, policies, and belief. So through this um, conversation and story I'm gonna tell you, you'll hear how language is really important to me. Um, because we can so easily kind of lean into these terms that become so ubiquitous that you lose sight of what they mean in any particular context and for any particular population. So it's really important for me that I elaborate on what I mean. So when we're sitting around the table, you can either share that, that definition or we can talk about the nuance of the difference so that we can get to a common ground. So this is my working definition of injustice. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, counterintuitive. Uh, so here are the conditions that I was always confronting. So as I began to work in cities and move beyond the scale of the building to the neighborhoods, to the city, to the region, I was often working in cities of abandonment where there was population or economic decline that left the landscape of vacant land and vacant homes. This is Detroit. That abandonment was brought on by the middle of the last century's economic growth and public policies that incentivized capital to move outside of the inner city core city and into the suburbs. Again, you're looking at Detroit and the Detroit region. Right in the middle is the 1950s, which was a peak of its population and almost 1.8 million people, all the way to its decline. As people fled poor urban cities in the United States and other parts of the world, it left this landscape of blight. It also left a, a, a set of infrastructures in city that became wasteland. So here again, we're, we're sticking in Detroit. Um, Detroit had these amazing radio boulevards that came from the, the riverfront. As population and economies and industry left, so did people. And their cars. And so this massive infrastructure that we built for nearly two, largely two million people became these wastescapes for a population that is now hovering at only 700,000, losing 60% of its population over the last 60 years. So we have sort of wasteful infrastructure. We also have urban wilds growing up in the spaces where we no longer have human habitation. This breeds an inefficiency, right? So if we don't have jobs and we don't have people in those jobs and in those homes and they've left the city, what the city also loses is its tax base. 
do taxes or what we use to support paving roads, taking out trash, keeping the lights on, right? So the inefficiency of a city and its remaining residents to have enough revenue to pay for every neighborhood and every household to have equitable access to services and resources becomes really constrained, right? And therefore very inefficient. What we fail to look at, and particularly those of us who are trained in the design disciplines, is to ask ourselves, what is that spatial condition and how does it affect those who are living there? And when we zoom up from the site and look at the city, we find that populations have begun to organize themselves through a series of policies and practices um, around these inefficiencies, and they divide themselves and discriminate against different populations. So here we're in Washington, D.C., and we're looking at the, the population of unemployed, poverty, and education. The darker the color, the more concentrated um, that indicator is in terms of vulnerable populations. It almost looks like it's going to be on one side or the other. In the middle of D.C. is Rock Creek Park and um, the Potomac River. And so D.C. has been this contest, contest text historically that has been very divided east side, west side, black and white. And what we're seeing is these social indicators follow those same racial lines. That segregation bears itself out very plainly when you look at racial dot maps. The blue population is African American, the white population is red, the orange population is Latinx, and the green is Asian. Does anyone know what the middle city is? Just shout it out if you do. Yes. And what's so fascinating about that, and you see these very stark geometric lines between um, red and blue, those are the geopolitical boundaries of the city. So any hip hop heads in here know Eight Mile, which is the line at the top. Um, that is literally the dividing line between Detroit and the uh, adjacent city. So the past of a stark geographic distinction between populations, and particularly at a time when we're so global relative to our access digitally that we tend to have a disbelief that we're living in such deeply segregated cities racially, but in fact, we all still are. And these types of spaces are some of the few spaces when we are actually in community with people who are different than ourselves. To go even further, if you begin to compile all these things on top of one, one another, architects' response, particularly in these moments of deep disinvestment in the cities, began to create an architecture of fear and separation, right? So we become complicit, not just planners, architects as well, and developers and those who are building the city that exacerbate these vibes in really physical kinds of ways. Again, those physicalities of separation, discrimination, abandonment, sprawl, blight, and efficiency show up in both social and spatial isolation, right? So now we have separated people, and you may have heard the term about people living in um, generational poverty. Those families who live in generational poverty, meaning that their parents and their grandparents, or perhaps even their great grandparents, grew up in assisted living, um, uh, uh, public housing sites means that that concentrated poverty in those generations have been in the same space of disinvestment and poverty and segregation for family after family. So imagine the way in which they understand city, the way in which they understand power, the way in which they understand community engagement, all of that is situated in that isolation. So how do we expect that we can come into these communities and do the work of imagining and visioning when in fact there may be populations that we're working with who have never been outside or exposed to the possibility that this status quo is not what you deserve, right? So that gets me to this kind of idea of injustice. So this was my first introduction to this idea of justice, which is really framed around this understanding of injustice, right? So what is justice, right? And we have to think about that if we're gonna take on Gray's question seriously. Um, a good friend and colleague, Deanna Van Buren, who is um, the founder of Just Spaces, um, Designing Justice, says justice equals healing. A lot of her work is situated around prison reform and the reform of prison sites in the country. 
And so for her to get to justice is to get to healing. And that's clearly a very important, I think, aspiration and value in the context of resiliency. But let's unpack this as it relates to justice. So I've been an architect at SOM. I took a sabbatical, did a low fellowship, decided to move into the public sector where I work in New York, Washington, D.C. and New York, uh, New Jersey. Um, I thought I was just done with planning and design. I went to culinary school for about nine months. Uh, <laughs> really fun and a much needed break and still, you know, a distant passion and dream to have someday. But then I got an opportunity to stand up a, a design center named after J. Max Bond. Uh, J. Max Bond was one of the first African-Americans to graduate Harvard uh, GSD. And after graduating in 1960-something, um, his professors told him that he would never get a job in a mainstream firm. So he went to Africa and started his own firm. And then came back and started his own firm and became a major partner at David Cody Bond one of the architects for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. He was an important role model to me because he was an African American designer um, in a principal position and a majority white firm. Different from being a firm owner of an African American firm. And so while I was at SOM and I'm looking for role models to connect to, Max was really important to me. So it was really quite, um, an honor to start a uh, design center named after him. And his notion of architecture was that it was, of a, it was a social practice. And that you couldn't practice architecture unless you were thinking about the societies that you were designing for and the way in which they move and inhabit and inform through their culture, space and occupation. And so this idea of the just city just came to mind and it was just an idea. And I decided that what I wanted to do with the design center is push it more into a research agenda as opposed to a community technical assistance um, organization. And so we would just do these random kind of crowdsource questions like, well, what is a just city? Let me test, see if this resonates. Let me see if this gets us somewhere different than I thought the language of equity was going to sustainability to me. Because remember, I, I'm now fueled by a sense of unfairness around the concepts that I'm seeing and who's being affected by them. So we would do these random crowdsources to see. Um, it was interesting to see, and I, I was a little surprised. And maybe I had in mind that people would mostly lean into values, but lots of people were talking about the physical condi con conditions or interventions of space. Um, People were talking about basic needs. People were just talking about playful things like the just city is joyful, um, which I thought was really fascinating and great. But people were really responding and kind of taking on this question. Oh, what is this? And, and the ways in which they might have thought about it through a utopian sense and the way in which they may have thought about it relative to a sense of right and belonging. So what is justice? Um, we have found and used and identified that there are four different types of justice that we could lean into. One is distributive, right? Which is fairness of what people receive, right? Uh, from goods to attention, its roots are around a social order. So if we distribute things in an equitable way, we still a sense of them, right? If you were to ask the average person on the street, and we did this, um, it is procedural. It's more about fair play. Have you been fair to me? People tend to think about the criminal justice system when they think about them, right? So now we have distributive, now we have procedural, justice as a process, justice as restorative. And I think when we begin to think about different populations who have been harmed, restorative justice becomes distinctly important, right? It is the restoration of something that has been lost or the repair of something that has been lost. Now you can even pick on that a little bit more to say, can we restore something that had never been granted? So we also have to be careful about when and how we use the notion of restorative justice um, when we're talking about the repair of harm. And then a really interesting one that I got introduced to by Seth Lowe was interactional. And this one is about the relationships we build with one another around trust and respect. 
Um, in order for our interactions with one another, particularly of people of difference, to feel just. So which one of these need to be activated in what condition and for who? And it's important that we maybe think about the deeper understandings of justice as an outcome or process or deliverable if we're wanting to pursue justice as a part of our work. So this naturally leads to for who? And you might imagine as I click through these slides, what type of justice do these different and in what context? So again, I turn to a colleague, Andrew Reimer, who is a biracial Native American out of Vancouver um, in a convening, she said something really powerful, which was, we may have an identity that demands justice and we can all look around the room and make assumptions about who of us needs certain types of justice or more justice than another. But we also have an identity that demands participating in justice for us. How are we making space to hear that and act on that? So wow, and this is a really tricky one too, because in this collective work of pursuing justice and the notions that justice may be more needed for certain populations, but other populations want to be a part of that process, it requires all of us to have a keen understanding of our own individual identities and scopes, um, how our work is being pursued as either benevolent or empathetic um, or understanding such that you can build that inter interactional and interrelational justice in order to pursue the work collectively in an effective way. So this is about power and roles in the collaborative work of justice. So I grew up on the south side of Chicago, um, which still today is predominantly African-American and a middle-class family. This was my home. If I were to ask any of you if you grew up in a segregated neighborhood, um, would you say yes? Okay, I did this in Virginia and nobody raised their hand the first time. Oh, 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 you guys all grew up in neighborhoods that had different ethnic and racial kind of compositions. And they were, so Oftentimes, when you hear about you know, someone coming from a segregated neighborhood, you think of someone who looks like me. You think of the minority population has been segregated, right? But if you, and it's not uncommon for us in the United States to live in neighborhoods that are homogenous. And you probably don't think you grew, are growing up in a segregated neighborhood. Well, neither did I. So this was my normal. Uh, and there I am on the first row. And I've always been like super tall. And this is the only class where I got to be in the front row because we were all sitting down. <laughs> um, fast forward to my decision at 14 to be an architect and the world changed. Right? So now I'm at the University of Notre Dame, one of three African-American students and only seven women. So let me say there's been huge changes on that front, um, but not on the um, a racial and ethnic composition within the United States. So my world is really different. So I'm operating now in a different space coming from the environment that I do. Um, and I have a pretty good time and I'm pretty successful at Notre Dame. And afterward, I go on to SOM. And there I am, um, horrible photo, because I'm in the shadow of the open door. So you, therefore, you cannot register any features on my face. Um, but in choosing this path to be an architect, my professional scope has been, you know, being only one person of color in rooms like this with you. Um, and so when I say that, you know, I didn't have the language or understood what I was headed towards or what I was observing, is because my context was Right? And this concept sets up a language and a vocabulary and a standard, you know, which you are moving through in a meritocratic way to be successful. And I have been extremely successful in my career. But it wasn't until I started, and there I am, because um, I had a successful career working with Bruce Graham at SOM on projects in London and Barcelona, and I had a successful career as a public official working with mayors Cory Booker and Tony Williams and designing Washington DC and starting to put Newark on the path. Um, but it was, you know, that transition from being an architect to architect to starting to work on cities and scales that were different than the sites 
And the understanding of how city leaders and developers and community and planning directors and financing agencies are really the ones that are designing the city. And you as the architect are being invited in to help them fulfill the policies that they are establishing. And I wanted to be on right? I wanted to drive that change. So I had the pen in my hand, and these are my sketches, in a different, really different way. I'm drawing these out with a Jim Colshack, right? I'm drawing these out with a Norman Foster. And we are collaborating on what it means to design the city because I'm the regulator and you're the designer, right? And so they're following our lead. It was always important for me to establish a client architect relationship that was collaborative because their experiences I have about place and their experiences I have as we all do with our own biases, right? That shape how we see the world and shape the perceptions of what we want. And so we have to build those collaborations in order to get to justice especially now that we are so keenly um, more aware of how different bodies occupy space and how different bodies have different needs as it relates to the arrangement of space and the design of space. And so, you know, we just heard that there was these sort of crisis points uh, with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Well, if you're a person like me, these crisis moments are only an awakening for you. Let's just be really clear about that. Right? You have been awakened <laughs> at this, and George Floyd was so poignant because you've literally watched someone being murdered on TV, right? Different from the other ones that were exactly the same. You didn't view the actual, you know, taking of a life. This is the difference, but this has happened all the time, right? But now when we're keenly aware that the occupation of bodies in different spaces, whether they be black bodies, multicultural bodies, women, and the attacks on women as it relates to faith and rights, LGBTQ plus, um, faith oriented types of contests. But also, you know, it's easy to kind of understand justice and injustice through a visual lens, but it's also important to understand justice through the voices or the lack of voice that those populations have in the power dynamics of making choices about the design of place, right? And how representation through monumentality is an expression of voice and identity. How protest is an expression of voice and identity. How resistance is an example of voice and identity. And how that voice and how those bodies are able to occupy the public and not all of us are able to occupy the public realm in the same way because of a set of standards and norms established and those who get to determine or predict or layer on certain readings of people in certain place. So does this mean we have to think about how we design the public realm differently because of the way that we now surveil and police space? And by the way, everything is being surveilled. <laughs> buy a pair of shoes, you can be surveilled by the credit card company. You ever wonder why you get that same ad? <laughs> like a minute later, right? Um, public violence. And then at the urban scale, right? So how different populations and bodies and identities and voice occupy the city and influence the way the city is shaped at the either city scale or at the planetary scale, which is a lot of what y'all are talking about today. So this question about resiliency, kind of going back to where Gray was taking us for you to think about, I was sort of thinking about it too. And I was like, you know, I think resiliency actually really requires that you take up this notion of justice. And it's not just, it's not a, a luxury to do, I think in certain contexts, I think it actually demands it. And I think it demands it because this is how I understand it. Perhaps you can school me if I'm wrong, but you know, the way I think about resiliency is this ability to withstand or recover from difficult situations. This is how the person understands it, right? And then on one level, you know, speaking as an African-American, you could say just to bring the history of our existence in the Americas, we are an incredibly resilient people that somehow we've been able to withstand. But have we been able to recover? 
right? And so when we think about the language of what resiliency means, and we might conflict those two things. They're going to stand with one or the other, we're good. Well, not for everybody, right? And so it's very important to contextualize this by place and by population. So zooming to the America context in, in the United States, and this is where we're going to get a little uncomfortable. They warned you. Um, really fascinating book that I took up called Stand Your Ground by Dr. Kelly Brown, Dr. who is a theologian at the New York Theological Seminary. And the first chapter gives us, and, and it's a, it was a way into understanding the Stand Your Ground law that led to uh, the acquittal of Zimmerman in the Trayvon Martin case. And she brings it back as these underpinnings of these civil and Christian canopies that are used to form America. Now follow along, I'll be quick. So one is the Anglo-Saxon method which basically says that those who were chosen to come and establish America were chosen by God, right? And that there was this sort of religious underpinning to the Anglo-Saxon being the special people chosen by God to come and set up this new country. Go to the blood canopy, which begins to talk about the belief that the Anglo-Saxon has a moral superiority, right? To know right for wrong, which then begins to give that body the authority to create the standards and norms of culture, right, of the chosen people to establish the nation. And then we can lean into, and this is um, Dr. Douglas, um, lean into the Romanticism canopy, which then says, you know, this chauvinism that is around, now these people who can set these standards and norms have special gifts. We can then go to how the whiteness canopy translates into gender roles. Um, there was a time where we had a president that said that womanhood was here to bear the children. Um, and then we get all the way to cherished property. And so if you understand property rights law tied to human rights, particularly for African-Americans and even women, only folks who owned land, which were typically white men, could vote. Not women, not whites, right? One, because we were denied access to own land. So this idea of cherished property as an underpinning of Americanism, threaded all the way back, begins to set up the reason why we're having conversations about power and distributive power and where does power come from and how can power be realign to allow for more people to control the destiny of place and space different from 400 years ago. How can we overcome these inherent prejudices that exist within the canon of Americanism and actually really recognize they do exist and have a foundation that is sort of synchronizing the, the, the seed of all of us that we, we just don't kind of connect to in terms of its origin story. And that this notion of privilege is now expanding not just to a racial issue, but there are deep privilege issues around our income divides that create further separations. And that these things have contributed to intentional policies that set up those conditions of injustice that I showed you. So all of this is to say that there's a real evidence of why we're having this conversation. There's evidence of why we need to have this conversation. There's evidence of why justice is not a discretionary goal and objective when we're talking about resiliency, right? Because the emergence of intolerance on all sides in the polarized context of the United States is growing and growing by the day. And now we see it growing and growing other nation states around the world. So what we really need to do if we're interested in justice, and in, in this country, racial justice in particular, is be very clear with our language and intention. With the understanding that understanding American exceptionalism is founded on while there were barriers, even for white folks that they had to overcome, there were advantages inherently embedded in their ability to 
The first half of the last century, the rights were around equality, equal access to education, equal access to transportation, equal rights to vote. And again, this is not just around racial lines, this is also around gender lines, right? So if we give everybody the same thing, even though the same barriers exist, we should all be okay, right? And you've probably seen versions of this diagram, right? Where the one person who is already taller than the other person give them the same thing. They really, that's really not an, an, an um, equality. It's a distributive equality, but the effects of that distribution do not yield the same outcomes. So the latter half of the latter, uh, last century, and even in, in this century, were focused on equity. The recognition that those inherent advantages and barriers exist and advantage some and disadvantage others. So we do need to think differently about the supports and mechanisms and additional resources that are given to the shorter person, the African-American, the woman, the person of color, the LGBTQ, so that they actually do have equal access opportunity and outcome. But ultimately, and now I'm speaking specifically for African Americans and not concept, if we really want justice, what we're really after is liberation, where the barrier is actually gone, such that we don't need to redistribute and distribute differently, right? What would that look like? Is that a utopian state? Is that a just city? So I think about that when I'm doing work. So, um, let's go to the lab and then um, some examples of how I play this out in my work. So, um, as was said, I first started the uh, Max Bond Center on Design for the Just City and then moved that to the DSC, um, known as the Just City Lab. Um, we've done a number of really interesting things, and some of which is try to articulate what our version of the Just City is. And it's where all people and communities, but especially the least not included, have access to the networks and environments that offer the opportunities and resources to be productive and prosper, advancing their social and economic mobility and agency. Um, as was said, we've done a number of different studies and publications. We've looked at legacy cities, these cities that have lost greater than 20% of their population and what are we doing in those cities? Um, and what are the interventions and roles that we can play in recovering them? We've looked at the presence of urban justice in public space, developing indicators and metrics so that we can create evidence that we were really creating the kind of social connection, cohesion, equity, inclusion, welcoming, and belonging that we think we do when we aspire to do when we're creating public space. We've done studio publications. Um, we have um, co edited a collection of essays about the just city, um, looking at 26 different cities from around the world. All of these are available on the website for free downloads. Um, we totally intended to make this a movement by making this information available. We look at design. We have a running catalog of about 25 different case studies in conversation with architects, asking them to tell us how their work is moving towards a more just city, what values were important to them, what processes did they what injustices were they looking to overcome? So this is an ongoing catalog that we've been developing. Um, we use exhibition as an opportunity to talk about this work and engage uh, folks who are experiencing the exhibit through oral histories that we allow people to listen to or through mapping exercises that allow people to tell us their adventures in the city. Uh, most popular has been the Just City Index, and this takes me back to language. Right? because I was very convinced in my work, and particularly my public sector work, that, that public officials were using equity as a kind of social whitewashing to say that they were down with going with equity. But when I asked them about what that meant, no one could ever describe it. And so what I was, what I was recognizing is that, you know, they were describing using different values. And so maybe we should be more focused on designing to those values as opposed to putting everything under this thick umbrella of all that. You know, a great example was the difference between safety, security, and protection. And I remember distinctly being in a meeting and the people around the room were using those three words interchangeably. And a young woman who had recently lost her brother to gun violence 
you know, went on this really heartfelt conversation around the difference to her and what that meant and why it was important to be much more clear about the intention and distinction between those two things. So we developed this as a tool so that organizations, cities, communities, whoever, could get to a precision around the values and outcomes that they were looking for and resist this pressure to lean in to the term of the day um, because we found that leaning into the term of the day didn't necessarily result in the authentic type of outcome the folks were looking for. So we've used this tool to create the meetings, workshops, masterclass we did in Rotterdam. Um, we capture the information. So we've been tracking how different cities around the world are prioritizing values in different ways around different issues for different populations. Um, we do evaluation work. We created these, um, the um, indicator framework for public space and justice. Oh, and that's wrong. And we speculate through design studios. And so pattern language was mentioned, which was a design studio we did in Pittsburgh. Our design studios tend to have architects, urban designers, and planners and landscape architects. I was, I've always loved Christopher Alexander's pattern language. Right? And this idea that there are a series of types of interventions that are responding to a set of conditions. And so it was interesting to match that up with justice. So we layer into that this interrogation and this naming of conditions of injustice, which Christopher is agnostic about, right? We layer in this idea of what values are important. And then we produce this patterns that resolve conditions of injustice. So it was a really fascinating um, studio. We looked at four different neighborhoods that were either transitioning, emerging, distressed, or gentrifying. Um, we had 12, 13 students come. We did field work on the ground. We interviewed a number of different people from different types of positions of power and authority within the city and these neighborhoods. We came up, I think, with about 50 different patterns of injustice, and we compared them across the different neighborhoods and relative to the city. We indexed the patterns of injustice with the patterns of justice, with the neighborhoods, with the values, so you can begin to see the interconnection between how different interventions of justice might um, accommodate multiple or the same value, and that can be shared and used in different neighborhoods. Um, the patterns um, divided into these three uh, typologies around um, in the space of the public, neighborhood change, and mind, body, and soul, and I'll just show you a couple. So in the space of the public, you know, it was really interesting to look at different scales of civic infrastructures. Um, Pittsburgh is a very, very hilly, beautiful city, and it has these public stairs as a part of their infrastructure. We found in most neighborhoods, these infrastructures were not maintained at all. So it was really important that the city saw that, the students saw that as a clear condition of injustice, this public commons that wasn't maintained and looked at strategies to address those. In another neighborhood that was deficient in public furnishings, saw that people were pulling out, you know, the old uh, easy boy chair or the lawn chair from the background and literally put it on the sidewalk and they socialized and engaged and created a public realm. So this student created a vending machine of inflatable public furniture that people can use in the neighborhood. So the fun thing about this was, and it's also was horrifying. So every student had to come up with at least five different interventions. So if there are any architects in the room, you're like, what? Like I could barely do one project in a studio. But what we found is we did some shredding and workshopping actually in Pittsburgh, but the ideation of trying to lean into these conditions of injustice, because they were pissed about them, right? They were really surprised after we came out of the first shred of how many different thoughtful, kind of out of the box, innovative ideas when unencumbered by, you know, the need to produce it in a different format came to be. So we end up creating 50 um, of these as, as well. Again, that's available online. You can download that book. So finally, as a practice, let me just talk about two examples of how this shows up in my consultancy, Urban American City. So here, um, theologian Steve Junkite um, said that if you were to address the very real traumas of human life, 
if you were to wish to create an imagination of human flourishing in utopia, what symbols would you use to do that? He was teaching a course where he was very interested in future. So it's like we talk today, it's fantastic. Um, and I love this because I, I like giving myself the luxury to think about utopia, even though I'm working on real projects for real clients with real urgency, but I also have this space you know, in the academy and the research center. And it's a nice way that I can push those two things against each other, such that the work that I'm aiming to produce in the real world is going a bit further than it would if I otherwise wouldn't take the time to think about the possibility of a just city or a utopia. So his words reminded me of that. So the principles of our practice are built on a disruptive framework of policy and practice that produce outcomes designed to break down historic structures and systems of oppression, inequality, and access. And I've been really fortunate to have clients find me who are deeply interested in doing the work of revitalization, economic growth, um, preservation, adaptive reuse, but also recognize the realities of some of the contests that exist in their communities that are the legacy of disinvestment, discrimination, exclusion, and extraction, right? And so this notion of a just urbanism for me has to be restorative and disruptive. It has to be value-based. And there has to be cultural competency. We have to know how to talk and engage with people of difference. It must be cross-disciplinary. It must value community expertise just as much as technical expertise. It has to be grassroots and grass tops. It is inherently political and there must be accountability. So of two notions, the first one is justice of land where ownership is an important value. So here I've been working in my hometown of Chicago. Um, and here's Chicago's racial dot map. Um, in this case, uh, the green is African American, the orange is uh, Latinx, and the blue is African American. So still fairly um, racially divided in terms of enclaves so that divide themselves north, south, and west of the city. Here we've been working in three neighborhoods um, in the mid south side around historic Washington Park and Jackson Park, part of the Olmstead and necklace of the city. Um, and it's the neighborhoods that center around the future Obama Presidential Center in Jackson Park. Um, it was important to the Obama Foundation and the University of Chicago that they stand up a new uh, community development organization to ensure that the, the imminent you know, economic impact of these types of investments in neighborhoods would not lead to wholesale disruptive gentrification and displacement, right? So the thought was you can start to do a conventional plan around neighborhood assets that build a community plan that will allow for the expanding of that potential displacement. It was important for us to remind ourselves of the history of this place. Um, in Know Your Price, Value in Black Lives and Property in Black Cities, Brookings Institute senior fellow Andrew Perry reminds us that central to the idea of the American dream is the belief in a land of opportunity in which any person, regardless of the background, can with hard work climb economic and social ladders to attain a home, start a business, or retire with a security of income. This is really interesting because during both periods of the Great Migration in the early 19-teens, 1920s, and 30s, African Americans migrated from the rural South to the industrial cities of the North, and Chicago was obviously one of them. They landed in these neighborhoods and it was known as Black Metropolis. Some of the country's first Black banks, insurance companies, newspapers, prominent doctors. It was a neighborhood of Black wealth as well as working class. The, the folks of generational poverty today likely don't know the history that in fact rich Black folks actually live in these neighborhoods and they look around today. So it's important for us to understand that this notion of neighborhood revitalization, particularly in neighborhoods of, of color, are often starting from a place where there was never nothing, right? There was actually extreme black wealth here. Racial restricted covenants, property covenants, redlining and blockbusting formed an impenetrable barrier, intentionally constraining the geography and economic ability of black folks. So while there was wealth being generated in this neighborhood, policies constrained their physical geography. These practiced simultaneously and systematically devalued Black land assets and deepened the narrative of Black inferiority and Black neighborhood undesirable. 
So now there's this narrative that we understand, that we think we understand about black right? That is what it is to forward low income. Investment. And so it's these things too that we also have to unravel if we're to do this work with intention. Um, in 2018, Brookings went on to do a study on Black housing assets and found that owner occupied homes in Black neighborhoods are undervalued by $48,000 on average in comparison to the same home owned in a white neighborhood, totaling over $156 billion in annual cumulative losses nationwide. So just let that sit for a minute um, as again, this evidence of the discriminatory practice that is in place that we're trying to seek justice for. So the idea of doing this type of community development and community planning for us rested on the rebuilding and resituation of Black lives and how we need to lessen the vulnerabilities that, that folks in these communities have such that wealth can be rebuilt. So in this case, the vacant land that most people would think is derelict and part of the kind of way in which we think about this invested neighborhoods was actually an asset. It's an asset to be realized um, and the value to be recaptured so that we can protect the neighborhood against the negative consequences of land speculation and cultural erasure and transform the kind of vulnerabilities that we tend to see on the surface um, around illegal dumping, unmanaged lands, and isolation and, and, isolation and um, income insecurity, right? So if we were to take that land and ascribe to it the proper value or the right value, right? How can we use that land as asset to regenerate wealth? So we stood up a, a project called Terra Firma, um, which aims to stabilize and move folks into ownership. It starts with a kind of land care initiative where we clean, green, and beautify the vacant land. It then moves into activating that um, vacant land such that stewardship is built. Um, this puts us in a position of ownership and development. And most of the land that we're talking about is city owned. Doing that suggests that we can build a market or correct the market's perception of devaluation through these interventions. So even the idea of programming the land, beautifying it, activating and engaging people can help to promote the sense of greater safety, improved walkability, improved mental well-being, which sends a signal to financial markets. We can start to do land care. We can clean it. You know, we can grow things on it. We can remediate it. We can monitor it for environmental conditions. This, this environmental resiliency and this idea that cumulatively we create better health also can translate into economic value. And then ultimately leading to improvement of the land such that we are looking at this larger ecosystem of neighborhood development, which is all centered on how land can regenerate wealth for residents there. And then lastly, I'll leave you with an idea of justice as an equity investment by looking at a project that we did with Stoss Landscape Urbanism in your hometown of Portland, St. Louis, uh, which is the Chodo Greenway now known as the Brickline Greenway. Um, this starts with this understanding of what is a just public realm. And typically when you know, we're asked to kind of think about public spaces or public parks, it's usually looking at these issues of capital, maintenance needs, um, distribution of public spaces, the access that you can provide to public spaces and the quality of the public space. But we found if we're trying to get to resiliency, for example, we also need to look at the ownership structures and the financing structures, whether they're public or private. There's lots of movement around privatizing public spaces because cities don't have enough resources to do it. Um, the idea that when you begin investing in public spaces, that makes the value of land around it go up. So now you're starting to talk about how public spaces create a gentrification. So now you have to get thinking about these ideas of retention versus displacement when we choose to improve or create a public park. And then similarly, this notion of how healthy green spaces create and promote healthy bodies. But if we wanna to get to justice, we have to think about all of those things 
plus thinking about the signals that aesthetics and identity might play. Who uses and designs the public space, the structures of power that make decisions, and this notion of how these spaces promote notions of safety, security, or protection. So this means that we have to have intention when we design the public realm. What does a just, equitable, healthy public system look like? We have to think about the investment streams. What should be the criteria for investing and how should these investments be prioritized and by who? We have to think about inclusion. How can the process of establishing values, scope, and investments be democratized to include community voices? And by community, I just don't mean resident folks. I mean business community, nonprofit community, faith-based community, government community. And we have to think about impact. How do we maintain affordability while also creating value in these areas adjacent to new civic infrastructure, investments, and without displacement? So just so we can round out the racial dot mapping, here's St. Louis, again, green, and here is African American, who's right, deep racial divide in the city. So one of the things that was important to us was the physicality of this five mile open trail, which at first was described as, as just moving east and west, connecting two historic parks, Forest Park and the Arch Ground. They said they wanted to be serious about equity. So we told them the geography of the trail had to change. We had to physically break that racial divide that I showed you on the dot map and convince them to add another leg, which coincidentally connected the other two historic parks of the city. So it was sort of a no-brainer when we sort of made the map for them. And the ways in which we can now include 22 different neighborhoods and 22 different neighborhoods of identity. So the trail really could be this binder of the civic identity of the city, inclusive of all identities. Obviously, in any project like this, it's important to kind of look at criteria, feasibility, connectivity, and constructability. We ask them to also consider impact, equity impact. What impact could be made, and how could you measure that equitable impact distinctly and differently? So of course, you know, as an urban trail, we're looking at the conventional sort of ideas of identity through landscape, through materiality, um, through signage. Um, but it was also important for us to look for and expand on how cities in particular tend to think about equity on construction projects, whether it's public realm or buildings. So one, they look at it through minority contracts. So if a city owns land and it's selling it to a private developer or the city is building some infrastructure, nowadays in the United States, it's very important for that city to require some percentage of that contract, particularly on the construction side, sometimes on the pre-development side for us architects and things, that some percentage be given to a minority a woman owned enterprise, right? So that is a very sort of um, conventional now way that cities look to build equity into their design and development work. The other way is on engagement, recognizing that we've had these communities that have been dislocated from decision making. So one really easy way to remedy that is to bring them to the table and to engage them in some meaningful way. A lot of times when you go out into the world and you're starting to do this work, um, this is the two ways that your client, city, private sector is going to tell you this is how equity is going to be realized. We found that wholly insufficient given the demand of, of inequity that existed in the city. And so our job was to fill in the gap. And we began to look at and develop 26 different practices of equity that could be used around business job and wealth creation, quality of life in neighborhoods identity and culture, and civic and community participation. And within each of those, there are different levers that could be pulled. So this one is quality of life and neighborhoods. So on the green way, we could realize that through environmental stewardship, health and wellness and recreation. But you know, there's only so much you can do on a trail, right? But adjacent to the trail gave us another geography to realize equity through expanded mobility, multiple modes of transportation, public safety, affordable housing, anti-displacement policies and investments, community development capacity building, and community planning. 
planning around the anticipated you know, improvement of the public sector can help to put forward a more equitable outcome. We did the same thing around issues of identity and culture. We then used that menu of options as we looked at different segments of the trail and working with communities to say, well, which one of these levers is most important for your part of the trail to realize and feel like the outcome has been equitable, both on and off. So different sections of the trail as it moves throughout the city have a different combination of these tools to use in partnership with different actors, whether it's the public sector, the trail developer, private sector developers, landowners, and businesses to ensure that the investment being made by the city could yield an equitable outcome for that place. So in that particular neighborhood, a series of interventions can be planned. And then again, while there are common sort of materiality identities that tie the bind the trail together, the equitable outcomes that each neighborhood needs to fulfill its agenda and ambition for equity might look different. So as I read you, and as you come one step closer to the cocktail, how will you consider justice and the city? Thank you. Um, I think um, where my question is I found in the research on understanding equity in terms of getting access to public space that a lot of private developments that shape those public spaces actually use exclusionary architecture to justify the high cost of the private development. So, in a way, the, the ability to exclude justifies why people would pay more to access those spaces. So if, if you were to talk about like uh, politics or something, it might be considered like a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we're talking about here, um, in theory, is that equity is good for everybody. But from a, a developer standpoint, they might argue that actually that type of equity lowers the cost of life. So I'm interested in your comments. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. <laughs> um, she was asking, oh, uh, commenting, I should say, uh, asking, um, you know, with our system, you know, advantages, you know, private enterprise, right, and profit. And so you are going to have developers who are looking for a highest and best use and a high rate of return and have no need or interest to build affordability or broad exclusion as part of your development. That's not going well. The good news is we do have developers who are interested in a new way of There are thoughtful developers in the affordable housing space that are private sector developers. There are nonprofit community developers doing so. You know, I, I, I sort of would say that. What my time in the city showed, um, and by the way, for if there are any architects in the room, just know that your career will take you to so many different places. I had no vision of like working for the city or being a client like that never crossed my mind. Um, I was interested in having a certain impact. And so I made decisions about where I worked based on where I thought I could make in all these different spaces. That's a side of your comment. Um, what brought me to that is when I spent time in the public sector, what I realized as someone who is now in charge of trying to balance the needs of the citizenry, which includes private sector developers, as well as folks living in disinvested communities, right? And so, you know, I had to have this ability to zoom up 
and look at policy that I could implement across the city, but it might not show up equitably in every neighborhood, right? So a good example of that, is, and this is something we're able to do in the city, kind of a strong part of the city and part fueled by the economy and the investments that the private sector is making as well as the federal government. You know, we were able to implement something called an inclusionary zone. And we were able to drill all across the city, and we were able to make it mandatory. We first made it in, um, voluntary, meaning you could choose to adopt into um, building affordable housing in a particular part of the city, and there was always an incentive for one to do that. But as the economy became so robust, and there was actually resource to do it, we started to make it mandatory. And it was a zoning policy across the city. So this was a way for us to start to signal to the market to be more distributed about a fair share of that housing. But you can't do that in Detroit right now. Right? One, because it doesn't have the same kind of affordable housing as a, a Washington, D.C. or a San Francisco or New York. And two, the economics of developing a weaker market to be a very different kind of economy. So this is only a lesson to say, you know, we all we can do is find ways to push those agendas in the context that we can. It will never be a sweeping wholesale, you know, response to that aspiration. But it doesn't mean we should try to figure out where we can push it in. It, it requires understanding, you know, the physicality of place, the economics and markets of place, um, of, of a particular city, a particular neighborhood, and a particular region. And finding the levers that can be pulled to try to advance that agenda is on the top. Yeah. And you have to guess. <laughs> I can. Um, I, 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 you know, I think there are different levels. So she's asking about um, the power of representation when you have that kind of concentration of poverty or race in a geopolitical manner, right? So, answer that maybe a couple of ways. And then, so about maybe two interpretations of representation. So, one is our elected representation, right? So, presumably, presumably or we would hope, that people exercise the right to vote to put in place a representative who represents their interests in the larger governance of the city. In the United States, our own turned out, sir, you know. And I think if you've been in a community that has been harmed, disinvested, discriminated against, extracted, exploited, whatever, your faith in that system has diminished. Right? So either you're maybe got to vote and not really, you know, have a lot of confidence in your leader, or you're just not going to vote. So that's a, this sort of official political capital. At the smaller feet level, the idea of representation around do communities like that still have enough willingness and capacity to mobilize their own social capital to change? So now we're into the activism space, right? And you've probably heard stories of resident or tenant organizations self-organizing, you know, to represent their own interests, you know, for their demands. So, so when that's at play, then I think you have much greater, you know, opportunity to move the needle on change, whether you're low income, whether it's neighborhood poverty, whether it's neighborhood land. Right, so that becomes less relevant if that social capital can be overwhelmed. They're often fighting against the kind of injustice that they talked about. But we're seeing that and there are great examples of that happening in communities like that. So it kind of depends on whether there's the ability to mobilize that social capital to, to activate against injustice. And sometimes in 
resistance to the more political representation that is voted in the more formal language. Like in a true question of the world? Okay. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, I don't think uh, Chris would have to be able to get I think in your play, uh, you said uh, that it's close to the opponent because it sits on the chapter. It's a painting. But we know painting. It's a what? It's a painting. It's a painting. Yeah. Healing. Yeah. Healing. 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 Yeah. Healing. 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 Or the concept of understanding can be achieved before the curve can be achieved. Oh, that feels like it. Okay. Um, <laughs> and a trick question, right? Because I have a point of view of that. Yeah, I, I suppose so. I mean, I, I hesitate to say no because I don't see a reason why I couldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. I feel like, though, in the context in which I work, um, where there has been so much fun, right? That there's just a, an enormous demand to heal. And I think the step that we often miss when we have these moments of crisis is people wanting to move into the conversation of solution without the healing. And so to me, that's what creates the, the opportunity for, okay, so let's jump and figure out what we're gonna do. We need and we talk about some ideas and then we begin to realize how hard those ideas are. And new people start coming in and get back into the status quo all of a sudden that moment. And I think it's past because we don't stay in the pain and the discomfort on them, to wrestle with like what it is and they heal, they can come back. So I said, when you're in that solution space, you don't get so defeated by how hard it is. It's freaking hard. <laughs> it's not easy stuff. They're complicated emotions and pains and guilt and language here is an understanding. We don't live and socialize amongst each other. So how are we to understand one another to come to some sort of reconciliation about We have different understandings of our own history. We have different access to knowledge of our own history. So my so if you ask me a question, I hope that that would be true. In this context of us kind of talking about the recovery and healing and built environment harm. Uh, in this context that I know most, um, it's just, it's the step we miss. It's the way which we have to figure out. It'd be interesting, you know, to kind of figure out in the sort of conventional architectural urban planning pedagogy that we move through and how to design the solution. What would what your conversation like that into the way it would be planned? What is the mechanics of that look like? And it shouldn't just look like what you think a community needs. Because guess what? You don't know as much as anything you can hear about these matters, right? And so I just wonder if there's something more technical or technocratic about those positions. I don't know what it is, but it feels like that has to be now on our concept design, schematic design, design, you know, somewhere in that whole continuum. What would it look like if you were to insert a few before you get to this point? Whether there's been harm or not. How about that? <laughs> You're welcome. Um, how many? Okay, so I'm going to take you guys there. Yes, it is you <laughs> with the cast. And the Thank you. 
Yeah. Well, one of the reasons why we put the index online as we read down so we down on the poster is to encourage people to use it in spaces where they are trying to build a bridge between language and intention. Right? And so we get you know emails and calls all the time like, oh, can I use that index? I'm I'm doing um, a program with kids, and they want you know I think this would be a great tool for that. Um, our our philanthropy is reorganizing our program area. We want to be more intentional about the value that we have. And so the tool is absolutely for that purpose, and absolutely for anybody to take up and figure out how it can be. So we have some examples of how you might use it in a community setting, but we by no means think that that's the only way that you can use this to try to help people be more articulate. And about their intention, right? Because we're not all gifted with a broad vocabulary that can connect them to the feeling you know, that we're trying to describe to someone with this really technical language, right? So it was a way to build a bridge between us technocrats and my grandmother, right? To have this conversation or a kid. But, but I find, because I'm, I'm actually really interested in more systems change within institutions, that we take for granted that our city planners and other clients know this language and they don't. 